that's I'm gonna thank you for telling me to press the button. Welcome again um, <laughs> to scaling community decision making. Um, thank you for coming. We're an intimate, intimate enough group, um, so please interject um, or comment, ask questions at any point. Um, so, uh, my name is Ben Melanson, um, M L N C N, my last name uh, without vowels, like we're Hebrew, most everywhere. Um, since uh, uh, my a domain that I had, Melanson Enterprises at the time, temporarily lapsed, and I had to find another one really quickly. Um, and I found MLNCN.com was available. That's now a Drupal 5 site that desperately needs upgrading. I am a professional web developer. Hire me to do your websites, because I don't do my own. Um, <laughs> I am a worker owner in the Agaric Cooperative, Agaric Technology Cooperative. Um, we've been doing web development since 2006. Um, I was one of the founding worker owners. Um, so the whole idea of uh, democracy comes pretty deep to what we do and to what I do. Uh, personal philosophy I have is that I try to put into place in our web development, in um, work I do in the community, is getting the most power possible to all people over our own lives. Um, and I like to say justice and liberty, it's prettier, um, but harder to make sure that you're to really talking about the same thing. Uh, power to people over their own lives is very uh, concrete um, because fairly terrible people like Friedrich Hayek have made very long successful careers as defining liberty as the right of rich people to do whatever they want with their property. Um, and as much fun as to have debates that maybe an argument that hinges on the idea that a person in a pit is as free as a person that is not in a pit is not the most solid argument. It's better to just avoid confusion at the start. Um, knowledge is not power. Power is organization. And uh, we as free software contributors are famously hard to organize. There's lots of memes that relate us to, to herding cats. Um, and um, yeah, it's uh, as far as making change, um, Marion Kaba is the one who said knowledge is not power, um, and she's a longtime organizer focused on ending violence um, and dismantling um, institutional systems of violence, like the prison industrial complex and practicing transformative justice in communities. Um, and I do feel we need to build power to make things better. Um, and how we organize ourselves is everything, but we don't think about it enough. And we don't think about it much for good reason. The odds are is that you don't have much formal say in how things are run where you work. Um, I think it was a little diff more different in Drupal for a while, where we had a fair number of smaller shops. We, even if they're not formally cooperatives, um, there's a level of egalitarian in that nature. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot fewer of us uh, in the small shop size now, I think. Um, and then in free software itself, the average free software project has one contributor. <laughs> Over half of all open source projects only have one con committer. Um, and so these projects don't have to worry about commu scaling community decision making. Um, and in Drupal, I think even on our random modules, we do better than that average. So we are in a cool position of being an open source community that is truly a community. Um, but there's things about the development of the open source movement. Um, so during the years in which the open source movement has been taking shape, a great emphasis has been placed on what are called leaderless, structuralist groups as the main, if not sole, organizational form of the movement. The source of this idea was a natural reaction against the overstructured corporations and universities in which most of us found ourselves, and the ine inevitable control this gave others over our lives, and the continual elitism of startups and similar groups um, among those who were supposedly fighting this overstructuredness. The idea of openness and structurelessness has moved from a healthy counter to those tendencies to becoming a goddess in its own right. The idea is as little examined as the term is much used, but has become an intrinsic and unquestioned part of the open source philosophy. For the early development of the movement, this does not much matter. It, it, it early defined its main goal, 
and its main method as writing working code and raising conscience about open source free software um, and the open group informal group was an excellent means to this end. The looseness and informality of it encouraged participation and discussion and its often supportive atmosphere elicited personal insight. If nothing more concrete than personal itch scratching and insight ever resulted from these groups, that did not much matter because their purpose did not really extend beyond this and now have become more institutionalized. But that entire quote was um, uh, from the 1970 uh, piece by Joe Freeman, this tyranny of structurelessness about uh, women's groups movement, especially in the 1960s. But I just changed a couple of the words to be about the open source movement. And we really were taking that approach of you know little meetup groups everywhere, very bottom up, uh, not a lot of structure. Um, and now we have a bit more. Um, and Drupal's governance structure now, I'd call it a constitutional dictatorship overlaid on a duocracy. Most of it is, you know, if you see a problem, you take action, you do something, it's duocracy. Um, but I call it a constitutional dictatorship because Drupal's bytart is written into the bylaws of the Drupal station or DrupalCon Inc. Um, as the one and only founding director possible and only two of the 11 to 15 total directors are elected by the membership. Um, and uh, I just uh, missed voting in the, the open uh, seats. I don't know if anyone else was paying enough attention to know that we just had the Drupal Association election. Um, <laughs> uh, and I feel really bad for missing that. Um, but uh, leaving aside the actual structure, much of my thesis here is that Formal governance structure is secondary to how communication flows in a group. Drupal could be 100% direct democracy and power would still lie with those who can get our attention. And um, so how would you communicate with the rest of the Drupal community? Post to the Drupal planet, knowing that probably you and no one else fully keeps up with reading that. Um, if you have, and, and if you have maintained a blog that will allow you to get aggregated on the planet in the first place. Um, ask the Drupal Association to add something to the newsletter. Um, if you and just uh, Drupal.org Planet is a really good feed that should be visited a little bit more often. Uh, <laughs> as far as getting a broad source of people in the community, uh, but ask the Drupal Association to add you to the newsletter um, if you read that yourself. Um, and the answer is going to be very reasonably, almost certainly, a no. Um, uh, do you know that even they know that the scary infinity I DrupalCon is iconic and will never truly be supplanted in our hearts and minds? Um, that's uh, Drupal.org Association newsletter. Um, oh, and then you can post repeatedly in Slack, um, which is some, but certainly not all the people. Um, or you can post in Drupal's matrix or to the 30 people still in Drupal's IRC, which has moved to Libera chat from Freenode. Uh, or you can work on the Drupal issue to actually bridge IRC, Matrix, and Slack, which has been stalled for a couple of years now. Um, or you can build and maintain your own audience, uh, but that's hard. Not that I would know from personal experience, Agaric, despite good intentions, has not sent a single newsletter in our 18 years of existence. You should totally sign up for our newsletter, by the way. If we ever send it, it's going to be absolutely amazing. Um, so how do you get people to listen to you? Where do you get your voice? Um, where do you get even your feeling of having a voice? Like, I mean, that's the weakest reason for having some sort of democratic governance, but still a big one that people have a feeling of influence of being heard. Um, and on that note, um, yeah, other software project we're involved with, Drutopia, still has uh, decisions to be made, um, and it's trying to, you know, parallel be a part of the Drupal community while modeling more democratic structures. Um, so, do you speak to the manager? Is this where you just go to talk to someone in charge, right? Um, of course, probably in Drupal and any similarly open projects, you are unlikely to find someone who wants to be in charge, um, at least of the precise area that you need something uh, changed in, which is to most everybody's credit, as we'll get to in a minute. Um, 
to inevitably, um, yeah, for, basically for someone to be in charge, um, to have the incentive and the practice to listen to people's needs would require the community to be set up that way in the first place. Um, the inevitably elitist and exclusive nature of informal communication networks is not a new phenomenon. Um, basically for everyone to have the opportunity to be, to be involved in a given group and to participate in its activities, the structure does need to be explicit, not implicit. And in even now where we're pretty, pretty structured in a lot of the important ways of um, how to participate in decisions, it stays undefined. So is it simply a matter of just having the right people in power? Can't we just choose people who have the most merit? Um, and yeah, meritocracy is sort of a founding principle of the open source movement. And the ideal of meritocracy is perpetuated through it um, in the way people are hired, etc. But it's consistently shown itself to mainly benefit those with privilege to the exclusion of underrepresented groups and people. Um, it's never clearly defined. It's, I generally boil it down to this person is like me, they're good. And I, I actually, um, you know, a suggestion I made was sort of an early uh, help, help move our community to, be, to not really define itself as a meritocracy. We were using the word like most in open source at the time. But I was like, it's, it's not. Like, there's merits, an undefined concept, you know, even if you could pick some standards. Like, I don't think we want to choose people based on standardized tests, like, you know, how I got to be a national merit scholar out of high school. Like, that's, it's, it's a ridiculous concept coming from academia that we shouldn't be using in the real world. Um, and we, we did. We started talking about duocracy because your, your merit comes from actually getting in and, and helping. Um, and that at least strips away some of the mythology, but it doesn't really solve the problem of, of who should rule. Um, who should, you know, even if you had the standards, who actually decides. Um, and where we are at in the world is that uh, very notable that those people who most want to rule people are those who are least suited to do it. Um, Douglas Adams has a great quote in the restaurant at the end of the universe. The major problem, one of the major problems for there are several, one of the major, many major problems with governing people is that of whom you get to do it, or rather of who manages to get people to let them do it. To summarize the summary, anyone who is capable of getting themselves made president, president should on no account be allowed to do the job. And to summarize the summary of the summary, people are a problem. Um, and uh, sometime before that, in the 60s, Walt Kelly's Pogo character uh, uh, had a whole movement. There was a whole movement of people saying Pogo for president while he was in the comic strip, uh, actively running away from the possibility of taking power. Um, and it is a serious thing, is like that um, those who seek power are, are probably not the first people you want to have it. Um, and as brilliant as Walt Kelly and Douglas Adams were, they weren't the first to think of this. And ancient Greek democracy, which we are taught fairly incorrectly, is the first democracy, but in, very early in democracy, actually relied heavily on sortition. And sortition is the practice of selecting who makes decisions at random. Um, and so most of the important like day-to-day -day operations you would select a citizen at random and definitely in ancient Greece there's a problem of how narrowly citizenship was de de defined but it's still very democratic in that anyone who's a citizen could be put in a position of significant power for a set term and the sortition movement and people advocate that the idea is that you give people the monetary resources um, and the support and the informational support and the intellectual support to um, make decisions on behalf of the group. And it is someone who is selected at random from the group. And I had the 
same idea going way back, just it, not knowing that sortition was a concept, not knowing it existed, um, but just thinking about we had the internet and we had no way to communicate on it that wasn't either moderated by some self-appointed group or completely unmoderated. Um, and so I had the idea that we needed moderation of communication drawn from the group of people who are to receive that communication who are affected by it, who want to send it. Um, and since it doesn't make sense to ask everybody, hey, should everybody get this message? Well, it's too late, they've already seen it. Um, to use random sampling, to use like statistical polling, um, which I don't like for many other applications, but for this one, I think it's the only hack to scale communication and keep it in control of the group that's affected by it. Um, and that is what is finally built a prototype. Um, it will be at its own domain soon, pwgd for people to give a damn.org, not-for-profit started to help do this years ago, um, will be updated with anything. So you don't have to remember the gig elixir app uh, .com domain. Um, but it's not Drupal, it's written in Elixir. <laughs> um, and the Phoenix framework. Um, but yes, uh, so here's the beloved screenshot of a website that doesn't even have any graphics. The text there boils down to people share the work and the power of deciding what their community's baseline of community knowledge will be of what communication goes out to the group. And um, we hope that by building the democratic dissemination software and hosting it as a service, we're trying to make it possible for people in many different communities to share the work and critically the power of deciding what their community's common knowledge will be. The messages that go out to the whole community will be determined not by one person or a fixed committee, but by proposal of any person in the group and a decision by a fresh sampling from the group each time. And it really is meant for scale. Um, you know, as if you've looked at any of the social media debates, you'll be like, I don't want an algorithm. It's like, there's always an algorithm. The algorithm may just be your feed shows you every post from the people you follow in chronological order. Even that's an algorithm. This is definitely an algorithm. Um, and as uh, Zainab Tefeki, who writes really well on on issues of democracy and governance and media. Um, she understood the idea, but she said, good luck convincing people of the central limit theorem as an organizing principle in social movements. Um, but that's what the formula is, the uh, central limit theorem, that if you pull a sample, you, you know, as a sample size gets large enough, you get a pretty good statistical representation of the people in the group. So I think it's worth doing even if you don't do it on the statistical side. It's still sharing the work um, in, in moderation of hate speech and spam on the platform is done um, by smaller groups of people who've, who've opted in to be willing to look at that stuff. Um, so it's uh, just a mechanism for sharing the work by people being selected at random, and it makes it much, much harder um, to gain the system to abuse power. Um, but the way the central limit theorem works is that if you have a group of you know, 10 people, you need nine or 10 people to get a statistically significant say that this should go to the others. So at the smaller scales, it's just like a normal group. You post a message, everybody sees it. Um, even, and they can still decide whether they think it should go into the record as one of the messages that went to the whole group, but everyone's seen it because they were asked, hey, should everyone see this message? Um, even at 100 people, 91 of them will see it to decide. But at 1,000 people, you have a good sampling with just 278 deciding at 10,370, 
at 100,383, 100, and that's basically where it tops out. Like, you never need more than a few hundred people to make the decision. So 384 people can give you a, you know, as is what they do when they do polls, um, but yeah, polls uh, can give you a good representation of what, you know, should, do, should this be shown to a million people? And it's just sharing the work um, and avoiding the, you know, the problems with polling where it's, it's used as a tool to shape opinion <laughs> rather than um, a tool to um, help people make their own public opinion. Um, so I'll just jump to, from Drupal and uh, soft reviews for a moment, to personal experience with with uh, that side of shaping public opinion. Um, it's probably not that easy to see in the picture because it was um, not yet dawn, um, but um, in near North Minneapolis, this is about a dozen of the more than 200 police officers uh, who descended on encampment of unhoused people with about 20 people in it at the time and uh, another 20 gathered for an encampment defense breakfast because uh, we've been trying to stop exactly this scenario. Hundreds of people defended this encampment of 20 people at various times but a million more people did not even know about it. Um, And so I want to see what happens when the filters for what people know about is us. So if people are able to put out, hey, I think this is important, um, do other people agree? And then you see it. Um, and the fragmentation of media is an opportunity. Um, right now, people are getting their information from many various or no sources um, but enough of it still passes through more elite controlled uh, checkpoint choke points um, including you know Facebook and and Twitter which um, cry against very vocally about government censorship um, of their choices um, you know, uh, Zuckerberg's been talking about uh, saying government forced him to censor COVID-19 disinformation and earlier was saying the same thing about being forced to censor Holocaust denial. Um, but um, they aren't very vocal about how they've chosen to silence um, entire groups on their platform. Um, uh, just either no reach at all, just um, or actually throwing people off. Um, and this, you know, between the new social media um, influence and the old school media, um, which is increasingly owned by a handful of corporations, um, you know, what the majority of people want does not reach saliency. So people don't get the sense that they are in the majority because it's not reflected back to them, um, which includes stopping global warming, um, stopping the Israeli government's genocide of Palestinians, the old standby, and that will never get it, universal health care. Um, and the gripe is not that you know, content is moderated or communication moderated. It is necessary for communication to scale beyond a few or certainly a few hundred people. It's who is doing the moderation and um, and how is that and how transparent is that? Um, so this is uh, Community Planning and Economic Development Director Andrea, Andrea Brennan um, and an over, over, ridiculously overweaponed police officer at that, that same early morning eviction um, that spot is still a vacant lot um, and you know after this big show of force 
now city of Minneapolis and the state, if people end up on state land and the county, just shove unhoused people around daily. Um, just zero. And, you know, if we don't have the right <laughs> to, uh, you know, to, I mean, it, including encampment that after an eviction, people set up a protest encampment from the different ones that were evicted at City Hall. Um, and that was cleared within three days. And if you don't have the right to protest in front of City Hall about your home is being destroyed, like, none of us have rights. We have temporarily granted privileges. Um, so, yeah, everything is broken. Throwing Dylan reference on here. And i mostly talking about, like, you know, how structural change can make things better. But as we referenced, your people are a problem. Um, you know, if better decision-making structures are the solution, it's worth being clear uh, what the problem is. Um, and, you know, we are the problem. And I put this here because I'm very pro-democracy, power to the people, so to person, obviously. Um, but the good news is that, you know, people are problematic in fairly consistent ways. Um, and there's all sorts of stuff we do and can do to make ourselves better individually and collectively. Um, and this is talk on decision making. Governments just touches on a tiny subset. Um, one is that nobody cares about decision making process until there's something they don't like. Um, and the sortition for communication issue. Um, if you can get it set up ahead of time, it, it really mitigates that issue a lot. Um, and in that, um, when you, you know, when you do have something you want to communicate, you have a a path to do it, and you don't need to um, build your audience in order to be heard. That you have an equal chance as everybody else. Um, in getting your word out there. Um, and more broadly, you know, the, the solutions we're aimed towards are all the share together now. Switching to from Minnesota to Minneapolis Prince. Um, almost everyone nowadays insists that participatory democracy or social equality can work in a small community or activist group, but cannot possibly scale up to anything like a city, a region, or a nation state. Um, and David Graeber and David Wengro um, in several articles, but especially the book, The Dawn of Everything, cover the evidence of how it suggests that egalitarian cities, even regional confederacies, are historically, in the really long sweep of history and prehistory, um, it's fairly common. Um, and egalitarian families and households are less common. But um, as much as I mean, I think that the, most of the problems are top-down power and especially top-down violence to keep that power. Um, the, this is a picture from the Occupy movement um, and a general assembly there. I do think that we need better ways of of organizing than just letting everybody be part of it. So definitely with the Occupy movement, though, that was also um, very violently and coordinatedly repressed <laughs> um, throughout the country um, before, because it was getting too good at, um, you know, at, at just making people aware of, um, you know, alternative alternatives and of, of um, pitching um, a prime issue as you know, 99 percent versus the one percent and other things that came out of it, but you know from organizers in that and and related movements to Occupy, you know they have turned did have concerns with the approach of the General Assembly, um, an organizer in the Portland um, ICE uh, Immigrant and Customs Enforcement. Um, in an effort to shut down that building, he was talking about the term General Assembly gave me anxiety, um, and it did go the same way. 
whoever happened to be there dominated discussions and decision making. And so classic sortition is a better approach for most things, most day to day decisions to be sure, um, you know, big everybody involved or big votes um, for special things. But, but I think no matter what your structure of decision making, there remains a need for communication democratization. Um, our leaders are most certainly not regular people given support to make decisions right now. We don't have sortition or anything like it. Um, but instead, people seeking power are groomed and installed by um, people seeking power that just prefer to stay a little further behind the, the scenes. Um, <coughs> Peter Thiel. Um, and more to the point, there are multiple things reinforcing elite power. One of those is just the political science problem of concentrated benefits and diffuse costs. The image here of diffuse costs is marine microplastics. Um, and the image is very misleading because it doesn't show land microplastics. They're just not as much studied. But uh, yeah, all the microplastics they were finding in fish, they're, they're finding in all your other meat too. Um, so large groups will face relatively high costs when attempting to organize for collective action, while small groups will face relatively low costs. Uh, so when the small group has all the benefits and the large group bears the costs, um, you're generally going to have a situation where the large group bears the costs and the small group gets the benefits. I learned from this political, from political science professor Craig Thomas, um, and, but the credit for this insight generally goes to Manker Olson um, in the 60s. Susan Lohman later added that information asymmetry is part of the source of this problem. Um, and I feel that both can be alleviated with, um, in part alleviated with democratically moderated mass communication. Um, and I do tend to fixate on the injustice caused by more organized, unaccountable minority making decisions affecting a much larger, but unorganized majority. But there are so many problems that I feel are more just a problem of not being organized, period. Um, you know, yes, traffic's benefiting oil interests, and yes, you know, there's been long, long conspiracy to hide the effects of global, you know, hide this knowledge of global warming and to minimize the effects, et cetera. But Still, people who get caught in a traffic jam daily um, affect millions of people who probably aren't in the 1%, but like a solid chunk, um, a disproportionate number in the top quintile or the top two quintiles of, of wealth and income. And, you know, it's just a problem because we society haven't gotten our act together. Um, and tools for coordination um, I think where we need to go and just practice doing coordination. Um, so I wanted to just shout out groups that are doing, putting democracy into practice. Uh, Social.coop is host of Mastodon interests, part of the Fediverse, one of the alternatives to Twitter especially, but other social media in general um, that's out there where each server um, can run by its own rules have its own membership, and still federate and communicate with all the other servers. And it's pretty cool for lots of us. It's like, <coughs> lets us do what we couldn't do on Twitter. And just to contrast that tool with what I'm talking about, it's like that, you know, that lets you speak. Um, but like how many people you reach is still dependent on having developed followers and stuff like that. And plus, when you post something on social media, you're generally mostly posting like, are people going to find this interesting, amusing, funny? Just the issue on uh, the Visions Unite um, project, where it's really asking you people, is this important? And it's not being tied to their personal information at all. It's just like, you are being asked to make a decision on, on behalf of the community. Is this important to, for everyone to see? It's going to make people make really different decisions about what sort of information gets broadcast the most distance 
compared to you know when you're on Facebook or Blue Sky or Twitter or Mastodon or uh, any of the other Fediverse software where you're really asking like, you know, will my colleagues think this is, I'm funny, will my colleagues, you know, what it is, will, will I make, you know, will my boss, you know, like this or, or more to sense self-censorship side, like, you know, if my boss sees this, will they dislike it, will my mother not like it, will my grandparents, will my own relatives in Israel, all of that, um, you know, like, who's, who's, your decisions on different networks or different things. Um, all that said, the actual governance of this one instance on the Fediverse of social.group um, is really cool just because there are people are trying to figure it out. So um, social.group is a self-governing cooperative. Um, you make a very small monetary contribution towards hosting the server and you're a member and the decision making uh, takes place on Lumio, which is open source software developed by a different worker cooperative, um, not Agaric, a different one. Um, and it, it just has a bunch of, um, you know, democratic tools for voting um, and making decisions. Um, and I would see that as a good complement to Visions Unite style democratic communication where like the mass communication is how do you decide what the sum, what is salient and what gets into people's consciousness and then you can have better tools for you know making choices between multiple decisions and things like that um, so everything on wiki.social.coop um, explains how they're doing things and it's a group that's actively um, you know, working on making process, its process better. And um, yeah, I'd love to know if anyone else is part of or knows of any other groups that are sort of taking self-governance seriously and thinking about how to do it. A lot of what wiki, uh, what social.coop um, draws from, and I think they mentioned on the wiki, but even if not, I know that they're drawing from sociocracy, um, which is sort of a movement that's been around for a long time um, that we have also adopted some things in, uh, in Agaric, uh, our worker-owned cooperative and how we do things, especially the idea of having rounds when people speak, really standard stuff that's found a lot of things, but sociocracy um, has put it together in a little bit of a structure. Um, and one of the coolest structures that it has is like the, the fractal circle structure where you have overlapping circles and you have two people in each group, in each circle, that are one is responsible for communicating to that circle or working group is often how these circles really are and the other working group has someone responsible for that. So you always have a double link between them with clear responsibility for passing on communication. Um, and so where democracy is the rule of the many, with the idea that if at least the bare majority approve of an action, even if that action is to elect a representative, um, that action has some legitis legitimacy. So theocracy sees itself as the rule of the associated and embodies the idea that all people who must carry out a decision have to consent to the course of action, um, which I think in a lot of ways formalizes the way open source projects work, for formalizes a duocracy because um, you're not going to do anything you're not going to be forced to do. Uh, you're not going to, you know, you can't, as a volunteer in an open source thing, you, you can't be forced to do things. So, um, and it's you know, probably better to have that formalized in the structure. So everyone gets a say in the direction and conditions of their work. Um, and it also means no one gets to say they were just following orders. Um, and the structure is a bunch of circle overlapping groups, um, as I was saying, link by double link, a member of each circle delegated to represent their circle to the other circle. And all decisions made within circles are made by consent, um, which annoys me, it's just consensus, but sociocracy chose, chose a different word. Um, but it's to emphasize the fact that 
everyone in the circle is stating that the collective decision is one they can live with, not wholeheartedly endorsing it necessarily. The collective decision-making process requires everyone involved be heard from and the process encourages making decisions based on data and then scheduling a time to revisit decisions. Um, and you know, just bringing it back to Drupal, um, what leads to long-term success, I feel is new contributors with new ideas. People continue to join us, I pay to use it from another slide, but, um, but pay to use, I do think that software as a service is where Drupal has to go, I call it Libre SaaS, free software as a service. Um, where Drupal has to go, or any open source software has to go, um, to give people an easy, low cost way to get started. Um, but that means new users also bring their needs and ideas. Um, and if you give people a way into the code, if you give people a way into the community, um, you then get to keep building your community with new contributors, with new ideas. And if people feel they have meaningful control, and people do have meaningful control, you're you know, beginning to build something special. Um, and I feel like the big thing is moving towards the control of our infrastructure, beginning with communications, a material basis for survival, and then the supply chains, and so we get to like, uh, you know, re rebuilding society from the ground up within the current society, um, but taking taking a look at the real logistics of it all. But um, in whatever we're doing, I hope to practice the democracy, which puts those who are most affected first. Um, and David Hammer, of the, um, who's involved in worker cooperative movements and, and just international cooperative association, but cooperative movements as a whole, uh, has a quote, build institutions at world-changing scale. If we're not focused on things that build scale, we're not building institutions that change society, and if we're not building institutions that change society, we're not doing what we need to do. Uh, in conclusion, be inspired by this tiny rabbit eating giant blades of grass. Take it one bite at a time. Um, we've gone the rabbit. Any questions, thoughts, commentary, other communities, other software, calls for authoritarian responses? Have you brought any of, how do you see this, this approach showing up in the Drupal community when yeah. it comes to things like contribution, like modules and the course offer? Yeah. Um, I mean, so I think for me, the only thought right now for, um, for Drupal, and it's, it's very interesting, like if you go to Visions Unite, um, the, the beta software, like, we discussed lots of ways about how the groups should be interconnected and ultimately we simplified all of that out. Um, so it's got sort of this weird duality where like I tend to be like, I'm just gonna start a group about a cause. Um, you know, so like, I don't know, like, you know, Drupal Association should make sure all of its, you know, servers are carbon neutral. Like, like I'd start a group about that and that's really not a good approach. But the, sort of the idea is that I could start that group. There's an existing group that's just Drupal. And so there's the group of people who cares about this thing, and you're members of both groups. And so like in the group where you're discussing, and it's the same if you like, you know, the commerce module has a huge ecosystem community around it. So you could have a Drupal commerce group. And so instead of having anyone have to do the work of maintaining a newsletter that's specific to commerce related issues, you have this group and you just, you know, anyone can post to it, but the decision of should this go out to the other 10,000 people who care about commerce, <clears throat> it is made by a couple hundred people instead of one. Um, different couple hundred people each time. So it's just another place for communication and more communication where you're trying to get a lot of reach, not a lot of back and forth. Um, and then in that e-commerce group or in my like cause-based group, you might be like, I feel like we have something that the whole Drupal community needs to know, know about. So based on the conversations in that group, the members who, one of the members who's in both 
post it, just you know, manually post the message to the Drupal group and say there's, you know, you know, the 20 plus thousand people who are in Slack or you know, the total number of people who care generally about Drupal were in the Drupal group, you know, you've got 50,000, 100,000 people in that group. Um, you know, someone says, this is some important thing about e-commerce, about, about that commerce module needs from Drupal just to bring attention. And it's not, it can't cause anything to happen, it's not a decision-making structure, but you can bring attention to be like, and get more eyes on that issue that you know commerce needs um, to move forward. So it's that kind of thing. It's really just like you know, and, and that we can feel that we all have access to that mechanism because it's just there. It's like no one has to be the decision maker about should this message. It's, everyone has to be the same. We all share it. Um, and so you know, a lot of messages won't pass that barrier. It'll it'll be public, but it won't be sent. It won't be emailed, texted, whatever to, you know, the fifty thousand people in the group. Um, but, you know, if people, if if the two hundred fifty people who are asked to decide should it go to fifty thousand people think it should, it does. And, you know, just knowing that that's a a, a possibility, a mechanism, um, and that you don't need to. Yes. Build the communication infrastructure every time you need to get a message out. That's that's how I see it being used. <laughs> Any other questions? Are we the last session of the day here. All right. We're all going to the bonus slides. <laughs> Thank you.